Good evening, friends, on this wonderful morning, um, evening in South Africa. And today we have an amazing uh, opportunity and a humbling opportunity to be in conversation with, with, with one of our very own, our mother, the daughter of the soil. But before we introduce her friends, my name is Salayalo Aramse, and it is such a wonderful opportunity to once again be with you in the beginning of the week. And I am not steering this ship alone. I am with the gorgeous, the intelligent, the amazing, my amazing sister, my co-anchor, Panisa Sitlohulu Sahamutanyani. Hi, Osi, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you, Oslelo? I am good, thank you. I look forward to today. Today we have a very wonderful, a, a, an interesting and a wonderful conversation. Yeah, it's gonna be amazing. Yeah. So friends, as it is the norm, please call everybody so that we enter into a conversation that is fitting for the caliber of people that we have today, not only in South Africa, but also in the Methodist Church of Southern Africa. In order for us to start our conversations as it is the norm, we cannot start these conversations without invoking the spirit of the living God. And for that, I'm going to introduce to you, the, an ordained minister in the Methodist Church of Southern Africa. She is the former general secretary of the Methodist Church of Southern Africa, the only woman in this very church to ever occupy that particular role. And currently serving as the Bishop of the Namibia Synod, the first woman to also serve in that particular office. Friends, please allow me to request uh, Reverend Shamin Morgan to please uh, welcome and open for us with a prayer. Hi, Reverend Morgan, how are you doing? You are on mute, we can't hear you. Maybe I sound better when you can't hear me. <laughs> Absolutely <It's> so not. <laughs> how are you doing, ma'am? It's so wonderful. It's wonderful to be part of this conversation tonight and we welcome each other from across Southern Africa and beyond. And um, at the time when we are so separate from each other in our own little cocoons, it is so good that there's a reason for us to gather together, even if it's Absolutely. in this way. So I'm looking forward to reflect with you tonight on women in leadership. Absolutely. Shall we pray Thank together? You. Yes, we may. Thank you. Lord of heaven and earth, we come together in your name as we celebrate your goodness and your mercy, even when life is really tough. We celebrate, Lord, your creative spirit as you create women who are able to participate in your life-giving mission. We rejoice in women who are stronger than people think they are, women who have tremendous potential, but we still have to learn that they can do anything. We are grateful, Lord, for women who are role models to us in church and society. We thank you for so many women who are overcoming enormous challenges to be able to be all they can be for their families and communities. Oh Lord, we bring to you tonight our prayers for women everywhere. Women who are constricted and captive in another person's opinion, women with disabilities who are inspired to rise above what is not possible. Oh Lord, we pray for women in harmful relationships, for women who think that they are worth less than another, for women who use their every bit of energy just to find food for, that, for those that depend on them. Oh Lord, this week we pray for all women athletes who are about to participate in the Olympic Games, and especially for those who were turned away because their bodies don't conform to a certain standard. Lord, as we speak, as many who are so very privileged, we bring to you our sisters, our young ones, who we want to take by the hand and lift up and help them to understand that they can be all that you've created them to be. So, Lord, be, be our anchor in this conversation, that this truly may be a life-giving hour that we can spend together. 
We raise all of our women up to you in prayer, praying that you will give us a vision of your dream for us, that we may be united in your mission. Hear our prayers, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Bishop. Aus Palisa. Thank you very much, Bishop. I would like to greet everyone watching here today in the mighty and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And as Sister Lilo had said, welcome to this session today. We are talking about women in leadership, working towards a mission. And we would like to ask our Queen Mother, um, a very familiar face to this platform, Umamukireta Makwenkwe, to introduce the topic to us, to just, you know, share some words with everyone about today's topic. As we all know, uh, Mam Greta is the general president of e Women's Manyano, and as I've just alluded, she is our mother on the platform. Um, she has shared so many uh, moments with us. She has empowered us. She has been a source of comfort in so many things. So before wasting any time, I would like to hand over to Mam Greta. Thank you, Palise, uh, to both our moderators, our honored guest speaker, our presiding bishop, Bishop Morgan, everybody on the platform, on Zoom, and the audience on the Facebook page. I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, this evening, we have the pleasure and the honor and the joy of having one of our leaders speaking to us about this topic, women in leadership, work towards a mission. And I think everybody on this platform is very familiar with mission. Our presiding bishop won't be disappointed. We're familiar with mission. And with the topic tonight, we've been hammering about women in leadership. The MCSA even came up with quotas of 40-40-20 in all structures of our leadership. 40% women, 40% males, and 20% youth. But the speaker is going to tell us tonight, what's the use of that 40-40-20 if one enters an office without a mission? your reason for being in that particular office or in that particular organization? What is your purpose for being there? If you miss that one, it's useless to have women in leadership then because it means they are only there to warm the seats and not to deliver. And who's better? qualified to speak to us about this topic, if not the woman who entered the office in the Department of Minerals and Energy with a clear mission to put more women on board, to make women involved in that particular industry that was hidden from women. And when she left that office, she achieved that purpose and that mission. Who's better qualified to speak to us about such a topic? If not, the woman who's been a long time champion of women's rights and in all her leadership roles, she always focused on women. Even when she was deputy president, her focus was on fighting poverty and bringing the advantages of a growing economy, especially to women, especially to young women. That's her greatest passion. That's why we say it's a joy, it's a privilege, it's an honor to have a speaker of note equipping us as women and as young women that we should have a purpose for being in leadership. And if not, we are just strolling and parading 
doing nothing. Thank you so much, moderators. We are listening with interest. Thank you. Thank you, Mama. Uh, it is always such uh, a pleasure having you and all of the other mothers on this platform. So friends, without further ado, please allow us to introduce our guest speaker, dare I call her the mother of the South African nation, uh, the one that we are here uh, about today. Please allow me to read her, a bit of her biography, and then I will give to Ospalisa to read the remainder or the rest of her biography. Dr. Pumzile Blambo Nuka is United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Director of UN Women. Now, in her second term, she was first sworn in office on the 19th of August 2013. She is one month shy of her eight birthday or eighth anniversary in that particular office. As the head of the UN entity dedicated to gender and to gender equality and the empowerment of women, she is a global advocate and has led the organization's innovative work on disruption of society's norms. Through coalition and movement building, among global leaders in public and private sectors and with civil society. She is driving the role women in leadership and ending discrimination and violence against women and girls. Before joining the United Nations Women, she served in the Mandela government as Minister of Minerals and Energy and subsequently Deputy President working on the fight against HIV and AIDS and coordinating efforts between the private sector, civil society and government to tackle poverty and education issues. Dr. Mlambu Nuka also worked as a teacher and gained international experience as a coordinator at the World YWCA in Geneva, where she established a global program for young women. She is the founder of the Umlambo Foundation, which supports leadership, and education. Good evening, Dr. Kunzilam Lampunuga. Thank you so much um, for joining us today. Thank you. Good evening. How are you on this wonderful, well, it's cold in South Africa, but how are you on this wonderful evening? Well, um, I'm really fine, and it's wonderful to be uh, with all the guests who are on the platform. I must say it is such a great honor and privilege having you on the platform. Thank you. Um, so yeah, before we uh, continue with today's topic, I would just like to invite everyone that is watching here today um, to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's session. So for anyone that has any questions or comments, you can just write them on the comment section. And whoever's on the um, call with us, you can write your comments and questions on the chat box and we will um, then present them to Dr. Mlambunoka when we do the Q&A um, session. So yes, without any further ado, I would like to hand over to Dr. Pumkulen Mlambunoka. Well, uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to have this opportunity to talk to uh, all of you. I do want to that, start by thanking uh, an amazing person that you have, uh, who is in the Wesley Guild. His name is Dolani Kalali, who hunted me like anything in order to make sure that today uh, happens. And I just couldn't help but reflect about resilience. Mm. You know, people who don't take no for an answer. I had a really cramped schedule for today. He unscrambled it and forced <laughs> my staff to create the space for today. So I just wanted to give him a shout out. And of course, I think he is exemplary to all of us. Yes. And uh, I also wanted to uh, pass my condolences to many of us who are here who have lost loved ones 
in this uh, period uh, of the pandemic. Friends, co-workers, fellow South Africans, it's been a painful journey. A painful journey also that has been caused by the violence that we've seen in our country, in Guazulu Natal and in Houghton uh, last week. And say thank you to the citizens of this country who stood up and said, not in my name, protected property, saved lives. And again, and again, you know, our heart goes for those families who lost loved ones. For the clergy, especially, and I greet respectfully, Abafundisi uh, Abakulu Esinabo Apa, I greet Umama Upurity Malinga, Umama Ushamein Morgan, of course, Umama Uma and Nanongi. But I want to say I feel for the clergy because I actually think that they have this big responsibility of consoling all of us. And part of the leadership that we are talking about is learning to put your own pain aside and focusing on the task and on the mission. But I have been wondering how much saturated they are. You know, I never thought that we'd talk about saturation uh, because of grief. The extent of the problem is of that magnitude. So, you know, my first take on the subject that we're do, discussing on, on the mission is really about keeping your eyes on the ball. It is about putting yourself aside and it is about being relentless on what you aim to achieve, whether you are Kolani or we are Umfundisi, that passion drives progress in our society. The progress of uh, women in the United Nations is uh, guided by the Beijing Declaration. As you probably know, most of you, that uh, that declaration provides us with a rich blueprint and issues that we have to tackle as women. Before 1995, when this declaration was adopted, many countries did not have laws that protect women. In many countries, even up to now, more than 60% of their rights are not protected in law. So one of my missions has been to increase the number of women who are protected in law, who have their rights protected so that they can realize their rights. That still does not make that it is going to happen, but it certainly puts women in a much better position and that work continues. But before I go on about my mission, I want to throw it back uh, to you uh, again, just to make sure that uh, you, these are the, quest, the questions you want to hear and know about, or if there's something else that you are dying to ask me. Um, no, Mama, you can carry on. Um, you are right on the path that we would like to hear. Okay. So, uh, so the, the declaration, the De Beijing declaration uh, in which African women participated actively was also written uh, by women from all over the world. 
uh, the highlights of the declaration included uh, promoting leadership of women. Uh, African women fought very hard for the definition of a girl child, because they said, if you just say a child, a girl child who suffers child marriage, fem female uh, genital mutilation, who is left out of school is missed because this happens to her only because she's a girl. They also fought to, for political participation in peace processes. In many countries, as you know, we have wars which leave women out once the peace has been completed. They fought for economic uh, participation and women economic, emp uh, in economic empowerment. They fought for education and more. So my mission has been to implement and ensure the advancement of this job. But I have to tell you, it has been hard. I have not been able to implement everything and take it to where I wanted it to be. Not only has it been slow, it has been very uneven because there are countries who made impressive <laughs> progress, but there's many countries, especially those who needed most where progress was not happened. In the passing of laws, for instance, in many countries, the countries that uh, we were able to assist uh, in changing uh, the laws started with those countries who are much better economically and then came the rest of us. South Africa is not bad in this area, but countries where there's religious authority and traditional authority, that is still difficult to do. So this is the work that is still remaining. We helped and supported countries to change their constitutions. 35 countries changed their constitutions because their constitutions were discriminatory. When we adopted the, the charter, there were almost countries who, are, who were just in the two hands who had laws on violence against women. Today, we have 144, but not all countries impl implement in the way in which we need to implement. We then saw that education became critical to many governments. They budgeted for it, they took action for it. So in many countries where girls did not go to school, the girls began to go to school. But we still worry because so many children, especially in countries that are at war, still drop out and many still do not finish. It has also been clear to us that the agenda in Beijing was adopted without investments being set aside to address this agenda. So for me, it was critical to address the funding of my institution. Uh, I came to UN Women and UN Women was a 350 million US dollars, just a quarter of a billion uh, uh, do dollars a year. And obviously, I got a shock of my life. And it was also not as central in all of the deliberations of the UN as I had expected. So the need to make sure that there is no event, no conference, no activity in the UN that goes on without the women being integrated became important to me. And I am, I am glad that uh, 
this has been something that is embraced now by many governments and countries who are supporting us to diversif diversify. And as you know, each year we have the Commission on the Status of Women, where all countries come together to de deliberate on a topic in order to contribute towards the elevation of the status of women. But it is a tough conference because you have 194 governments that are very difficult with a different attitude towards gender equality and trying to get them to come together to make a decision is difficult. You find that instead sometimes of raising the status of women, the status of women is brought down. It is for that reason that we decided that we are going to launch generation equality to support member states, to complement member states in being ambitious about the changes that they want for women, to invest in the changes that we see as critical at, at this time, and to make sure that we have a much larger diversity of stakeholders that are taking responsibility for gender equality, become intersectional, intergenerational, diverse in age, diverse in sector, and making sure that it cannot be just governments and civil society who are playing a role. And that was for us a big opportunity, which we just completed in France uh, last year, having achieved uh, some of these critical milestones that I'm, I have highlighted. But implementation now, using the 40 billion US dollars that we were able to raise, something that took us five years to put together, moving from a quarter of, just above a quarter of a billion to 40 billion has been a, a journey of difficulties. And finding the diverse stakeholders has also been a journey of difficulties. And finding people who want to accelerate so that in the next five years, you as a big constituency in society can really see the changes that together we are beginning uh, to make. The focus of the topics that uh, we are dealing with in this initiative, which we now call Generation Equality, which is an addendum to the Beijing Declaration, are uh, gender-based violence, uh, economic rights and justice, climate change, leadership of women and women's uh, movements, innovation and technology, and uh, uh, sexual and reproductive rights. So let me stop there again and make sure, because I'm, I was hoping we're having a conversation, so I don't want to be talking alone. I would like you maybe to ask question, maybe with this background that I have given. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor. We, I think sometimes it's always nice to hear your progress in terms of your office and you know what your focus is and what kind of implementation you guys are, you know, are, are looking forward into effecting. And thank you so much for such a wonderful address. But one of the things I would like to also bring to the forth, you are saying that you have $350 million per annum which was earmarked for the work that you do. And now you're talking about 40 million rand that was raised. Is this over and above the 350 million or is it separate? No, no 40 billion US oh. dollars. Sure. Uh, so, but I must, let me just say, we did not become a rich organization. Our mission was to raise the money for women and girls of the world, not just ourselves. 
because this is a challenge that is faced by women everywhere in the world. Mm. Women's ministries usually have 10% of the budget funded from their governments in most countries. Women's organizations never have a full budget for the work that they try to do. And we see also women in private sector and everywhere still experience unequal pay. And part of the money has been to push some private sector companies, those that we could uh, convince to pay equal pay. We've also pushed uh, countries uh, towards minimum wage in the sectors where people were severely underpaid. And because of the pandemic, where the jobs that were lost during the pandemic were mostly lost by women, two thirds of the jobs that were lost were lost by women who do not have a plan for a rainy day, who are therefore exposed in this situation. So some of the money we mobilized for entrepreneurs in different countries to go to the relief of these uh, groups. So, as of course, for ourselves as well, and for other UN agencies who are tackling gender issues. But it certainly is a big run from the amount we started with for us to have generated this much, not just for ourselves, but for women and girls of the world. I hope some of it will come to you too. <laughs> that, that, not, that brings me to my next question. Uh, Dot, how do we access the 40 billion in order to maximize the work uh, and equipping women uh, in entrepreneurship? So how do people access this 40, million, uh, 40 billion dollars? Uh, so South Africa is a member of the countries uh, that uh, have helped me to push uh, this generation equality. And they joined the focusing on two issues in particular, gender-based violence and economic justice. Yeah. And in each country, there is a UN Women office so you will find the UN Women Office uh, in Pretoria in our case, and through that office, you'll be able to reach uh, the uh, area uh, that you want to approach, I mean, who you want to approach in, in the UN Women system so that you can be supported. You have to be very specific because we are so goal oriented. We are so mission oriented. Uh, it cannot be just in general. Uh, it can be, if you are going to do leadership, you have to tell us how we are going to do it. If you are going to do climate change and women, you have to show how you are going to be addressing climate change and women. If you're going to do gender-based violence, you have to show us that you need. As someone said, if you're going to pray about gender-based violence, we will join you in the prayer, but we'll not pay you to pray. So you have to do prayer and more yes. in order to get the uh, to get the money. Yeah, that is so amazing. And it also reminds me of a an Italian saying that says ora et labora, which yes. means pray while you work. You can't just yeah. pray and expect things to happen. There has to be some amount of work. Now let us exactly. let us let us talk about. Uh, women in leadership. In your years as a woman leader, what have you learned about women in leadership that some of the young people uh, will have to probably take from you? Yeah. Firstly, let me just say uh, we have to talk about women leadership because that's where we are today. Uh, hopefully, one day we'll just talk about leaders mm -hmm. uh, because they are good women leaders and good male leaders, bad women leaders and bad male leaders. So 
in every situation, it's important to read the situation very well. I think it is also our responsibility to support women so that more women become the good leaders we want. It will not be something that every woman has in her who find herself in a leadership position. She needs to be supported to be strong. And that support has to go with clearly helping her identify what it is that she's expected to do. Uh, I think of many women who are in politics like I was, when you get into the department, you have to know what is it that this department has to accomplish. Every department has a, a strategic plan that needs to be completed, has got laws that guide your department and you have to push uh, for compliance with those laws and that you then make your mission and you supervise that in the department that you're in, you don't stay year on year, you have not passed a law, you have not amended a law, you have not seen for the implementation and you have not developed programs that assist in the implementation of the law. So it is important that as women leaders, as women, we support the women. It is important that if you are a woman leader, you shape your destiny. Uh, if you are in a situation where there is no clarity about your deliverables, you make those deliverables visible. In that way, you will be able to manage yourself because you may end up going to many meetings, which are good to attend. It's good to be with colleagues, but are they all important? If you have designed your job description to align with the objectives that you want to achieve, you will prioritize what is important and have the courage to say no to certain things because you only have 24 hours in a day. And in that 24 hours, you have to do what is important. I think it is also important to be resilient. I have never worked anywhere where there isn't a pushback. People that will work against you and sometimes for the right reasons, maybe you know you are sort of out of the way. Yeah. Uh, but before you can be told that what you are doing is not what is desirable, you have to be resilient. I go back to Kolani. Demand what you think is owed to you until you get it. Yeah. We also have a, as women to lift as we climb in whatever work we do, because you know, it's very lonely at the top in every way possible. Uh, it's lonely at the top because you also just a simple thing have more possibilities to change and contribute to the change of other people's lives than yours your life is in the hands of other people you will find that as i found out to my shock when i became a deputy president that going out of the gate of my house is a crime I cannot do that for myself uh, because I have to live within the, the, the guidelines of security and so on. 
and yet there are so many other decisions I can make which are not necessarily about me. And I found that very frustrating. It has taken me a long time to learn to push the envelope sometimes, but many of the times to, make, to ensure that the systems that we have adopted, we also respect. We do even the things that are not comfortable to us in order to make sure that even the people that are supposed to reinforce the systems are able to do their work without being stressed by you. So, yeah. Sure. My next question comes from this, this uh, insert. And it says, yes. Dr. Mlambo Nguga served as the Deputy President of South Africa from 2005 to 2008 as the first woman to hold the position and at that point, the highest ranking woman in the history of South Africa. What have you learned in that journey, uh, especially about the negativity of being high up as far as the rankings are concerned? But also maybe on a lighter note and on a more human note, what were your most embarrassing moments while you occupied that <laughs> office? <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, I have to say that uh, if all of you remember, I was the least likely person to be appointed to that office for all kinds of reasons that had to do with the case that took the former deputy president out of the position. I was related to one man who was prosecuting. And for me to then get into that office, I said, oh, hell no. I realized that uh, there are chances that uh, this will create its own problems, but I was there and the most important thing in that environment was to think of the people of South Africa first, yeah. all the time, and do what you thought you could do to serve them. And learn to confront problems that you face and choose which are the real problems which are the things as a kasulayo, Koda, you can just, just shrug your shoulders and just let it go because it's a, it's a pointless fight. It's, it's, it's energy not worth losing and keep your focus on the, on the ball. But also reach out to the people you have to work with and try to create an environment where you can work together. That does take a lot. And it is important that uh, if you are a leader of a team, you become the example of what you want your team to be like. It was not uh, easy, I'm, I'm, and I'm not saying that this is easy, but this is something that is worth trying if you find yourself <clears throat> in these trying uh, situations. And of course, I had uh, a few embarrassing moments. Mm -hmm. uh, in, at one time, as a, a deputy president, I did not uh, realize that there are places I, I cannot go because I mean, a person like me, I started as an MP. So I know what it is like to be an MP. And then I became a, a, min a deputy minister. I know what it is like to be a deputy minister. Then I became a minister. Then I became a, 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 a vice president. So I know all the corners of all these groups where you find them when you need them. And sometimes 
it's not a necessary it was not necessary for me to always have to over formalize the things that i do and in many cases i would be fetched being where i was not supposed to be by my protocol people to say you are not supposed to be here you are now a deputy president yeah and yeah, it was something that uh, I would have loved to resist. But again, you figure out that, you know what, some fights are not worth fighting. But yeah. I would be embarrassed as I am whisked off uh, away from the people that were my true advisors in many cases and friends as well. Mm. So talking about, talking about that moment, and before I give to Auspalisa for further questions, you know, in certain cultures, and you being an African child, uh, a daughter of the African soil, uh, women are expected to act in a certain manner and, you know, according to, to certain con constricts and constructs of culture. So what advice would you tell to women who are seemingly constrained by tradition where acting uh, with assertiveness and being confident in, and with resilience is seen as culturally unacceptable because the man is in charge or that is the role of men. So what advice can you tell to young women who find themselves in those type of situations? Um, I mean, uh, we hear a lot about culture and culture is not static culture is dynamic. It can be changed and must be changed. I do not think that uh, you have to confine all of you to, to culture, but also you must choose your battles so that you are not fighting every day, everywhere. But there are many things which are important to you which has to do with your career, which has to do with your uh, uh, rights that you must not accept. No one has a right bigger than yours culturally and otherwise that can lead to the violation of your right. And that is where all of us are change makers because if we all do it, we then change it for everybody. I also think because Africa has a hierarchy which is influenced by age, we respect older people, that is still important to do. And you can be respectful without allowing yourself to be abused. So it's, you know, knowing um, when and how to make that difference. We have a UN charter, which is applicable to everybody. Countries signed and adopted that charter. They did not say, but in my country, we will beat up women because it is our culture. There's nothing like, there's no country that has said so. No country has said in my, in my country, uh, we will treat girls in a specific way. We will take them out of school because they are girls. We will force them uh, to marry. And countries who have said so, in the last few years, we have been dealing with them and we have fewer and fewer and fewer. And if we had all sat down and said, this is the situation you have to uh, accept your circumstances, no change would have happened in all these countries. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much, Mama. Just to follow up on um, your statement about girls not being able to go to school because of their girls, of their gender, of their sex, um, how is the United Nations, United Nations assisting um, with the ongoing abductions 
of young girls in Nigeria? That's actually one of the questions we also have on social media where someone wants to know that what steps have been taken um, because we know that some of the other girls have been um, found and they've managed, some have managed to escape. But um, I think this is one um, crisis that not only Nigeria, but the rest of the world is facing that we've got young girls who are being abducted and forced into being wives and stuff. So how has um, the United Nations approached that particular situation? That uh, is a good question. And it is not just a question of women. It is a military question because the girls are stolen by extremists who are terrorists, who steal the girls in particular in order to take the girls away from progress. Almost in all situations where girls are, are stolen, there is a very messed up interpretation of religion uh, that suggests that girls uh, are owned almost by men and men can do anything that they like with women. Uh, we, not, not, not me particularly, but uh, the, the support system, the political missions of uh, the United Nations, the different member countries with stronger military have been asked to be the ones that are joining with the Nigerian army to pursue these terrorists in search of these girls. Sometimes they find them, sometimes they don't. Also very worrying is that in some cases, the girls are also used by these extremists as suicide bombers. And in the last year, we were, last two years, we are counting the increase in the number of little girls who have been turned into suicide bombers and terrorists boasting to us that they have a higher gender representation in their ranks. In some cases, women, get to be in positions of authority, even though they still face challenges in the hands of terrorists. And they will tell you if, you, if you are lucky to get them, that, you know, here I have food, I have support, and I have people that I lead and I'm respected. So I don't want to come back. So it is much more complex than we see, but I feel that not enough is being done by the government's consent in the countries where women are being stayed. We continue to campaign very loud for the release uh, of, of, of those girls. And we have a difficult uh, situation in that in many of the countries, uh, the governments sometimes are not as strong for the challenges that they are facing. It therefore becomes difficult because they do not want the United Nations to be the one that is in front in a case like this. They want to be the ones in charge in their own country. Um, I've got a question here on um, the chat box from Nancy. Um, she says, Dr. Mlambunoga, can you provide, can you please provide us with some of the initiatives supported by the United Nations to address issues affecting women in countries affected by violence, in particular, dealing with rape as a war crime? So I think it's something similar to what we have just spoken about um, with regards to the Boko Haram in Nigeria. Yeah. 
Yes, I think we have a program of women, peace and security, uh, which uh, focus on the women that uh, you are talking about. Even South Africa has just launched its own uh, plan because uh, you don't only have a women, peace and security in countries that has got violence, but you know we prioritize countries that have war and conflict uh, for that. But you have it even in a peaceful country like Finland, because the presence, the absence of a war does not mean presence of peace in most countries. So in South Africa, for instance, uh, just uh, yesterday, no, I think it's, it's, it's today, the Women, Peace and Security Group in South Africa was meeting to strategize on how to respond to the violence that we have seen. We are party to that. Uh, we are going to support also with the peace mediators, with people that you send into communities at a grassroots level to engage with the different factions in society and try to go deep in order to bring the communities together. Sometimes you succeed, sometimes you don't. We have a, a mediators in Burundi, for instance, which we sponsor, which starts from grassroots level right up to the top, who are the ones that make sure that a violent scenario does not develop without anyone paying attention and making sure that the scenario is diffused. You have many of uh, those uh, women also ending up running to parliament and become the spokespersons for peace in their new role in parliament. Uh, in Sudan, uh, as you know, women played a critical role to bring about a, a peace. I will be going to Sudan uh, in the next two weeks, for instance, as part of the many peace missions that we do. And to engage with the leadership there, because the representation of women in the structure that Sudan is forming is not where it is supposed to be, even though on paper it is there. The women of Sudan themselves, who are highly educated, highly competent, are standing up. They just want solidarity. And this thing of solidarity has been very important. So UN Women, together with the African Union, came together to form the African Women Leadership Network, which brings together the women representing different people, women, women from different walks of life in a country to be together, to stand together on these issues. And I'm looking forward to the formation of the AWLN of South Africa. And I'm hoping that it comes quite soon. But AWLN in every country has also a strong component of church women who bring the moral authority to many of the issues that these women uh, uh, tackle, releasing women from prison, uh, dealing with women uh, who are affected by sexual violence. Because as you know, these days more and more, uh, sexual violence is also a means to subjugate women in conflict uh, areas. It has been so difficult for all of us to bring many of the crimes that men commit against women uh, to court. The one or two that we have been able to take to the criminal justice court, international criminal justice court, uh, was after moving mountain 
mountains. So the need for women leaders is critical so that the passage is not so clear. And of course, we work in Latin America. We have worked uh, in Colombia. We have worked in Peru. We are working in Guatemala. We are working in El Salvador. And we have worked in Sri Lanka as well with the women human rights defenders, defending peace for women, as well as the protection of women who fight for the environment in many of these countries against mining companies who are in some cases uh, providing interventions that do not help the long-term environmental viability of a country. Um, you have mentioned something very um, profound about women in, in leadership. I, I would just like to bring it into um, South Africa, for instance. Um, it is believed or it is said that um, we are doing quite well when it comes to um, gender equality, especially in leadership positions in parliament or in government. However, how do you think we can improve that ratio from changing it just um, in, 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 from saying we are balancing the scale with women leaders? Um, how do we then convert it from women into young women? Um, because I believe that one of the issues that we are currently facing right now is that majority of um, the country's government right now are pensioners, if we were to put it in, in, in retrospect. And um, we hardly see young leaders, particularly young women leaders. How do we then change that and groom young women into leadership positions um, like government positions? Now, absolutely a, a, a good question. Uh, engaging young people is critical. Uh, it certainly has been one of my missions to make sure that UN Women has an outreach to young women and young women feel at home within UN Women. Um, because if we do not do that, we will not have a long-term view. And people like me, who has been a gender activist uh, since, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, many, many years, we cannot be the people who are the face of the struggle. We need younger women to be there. And young people today, as young as 10, have amazing clarity. We have youth organizations that are led by young people. We have seen the young women uh, who, are, who are leading the climate. They, in Africa, they are leading the end of child marriage and ensuring that girls are going back to school. So we cannot say we do not have the women, that the young women, that is for sure. Uh, we need to put them in positions uh, of authority in the committees of the different organizations that they have. And we need to support their own organizations where they are by themselves. And we need to make sure that when they are in our committees, they have real responsibility. They are making real decisions in this organization. As I am saying now, in fighting to amend generation equality, the role of young women was critical. In Beijing, it was not. We fought for the recognition of the girl child and not so much the youth. 
And now we want the girl child and we want the young woman to be in front. That's where we are now. And we were able in France to bring young women from all over the world. Exceptionally amazing to see the amount of young people from South Africa who were there, who know exactly what the issues are and what needs uh, uh, to be done. To the extent that sometimes people are afraid of giving young people a responsibility, this is a chance you have to take for progress to be a reality. And this is the change we also need to see in government. Uh, we need to make sure that people who lead us have, yes, some people who are senior, but definitely have says, younger people in significant proportions. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Doc. And on that note, uh, in Africa, it is said that about 70% of Africa consists of the youth. And I think a lot of our governments need to reflect that in terms of uh, polity. Now, Mamu Greta is saying, Doc, how to channel certain concerns regarding women to reach the commission on the status of women? Serious issues affecting women in South Africa that were raised by women in the Women's Association were presented and debated at the commission by women in America uh, who were representatives at the CSW. You could see that they were sharing a story that was not theirs. They did not fully understand the issues. The Federation of Methodist Women is a member of the CSW, uh, but representation is from America. How can we change this so that African women tell African stories from an African heart? Well, this in some way is something that uh, the organization itself has to talk about because as a non-member, I cannot change your organization, but that change would be highly welcome. Now with the um, pandemic, when we have all learned to work virtual, there is never an excuse why you cannot bring people from anywhere in the world into a meeting. Uh, and, and in fact, bringing them in person was never an issue because many women from different countries can travel to anywhere. Uh, so this is a discussion that has to be put on the table within the organization so that as an organization, you make that uh, a decision. The issues that are discussed at CSW in the site events so they certainly influence how member states debate and, and deliberate in their own formal sessions where they can make a, 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 a decision. And what becomes a decision is what you see in the agreed conclusions of CSW, which is then sent back to countries and then countries choose what we want to implement. The presence of civil society of your country is always good because you know exactly what was agreed. You follow the ups and downs of the negotiations. So when you are back home, you are able to demand the implementation of the resolutions because you are already aware. Uh, so I think, and, and by the way, the president of CSW uh, next year, in 2022 and in 2023 is a South African. It's the ambassador of South Africa. The theme of CSW in 2022 is going to be on climate change and women. So women in farming, you, we really have to be start now preparing ourselves for the issues we want to be tackled on land degradation on how you empower women to be climate smart farmers. Mm. And the following year, the issue is going to be on innovation on tech and technology. Again, 
an issue that is very important to us. So I am really excited that as South Africa, we are leading CSW when the topic is so relevant uh, because coming out of the pandemic, these are some of the areas that have been complicated, uh, out of which we need uh, to see faster changes. Please go to Generation Equality website and you will be able to see the deliberations on some of these issues. You'll be able to see the opening sessions and how the different leaders spoke uh, about the commitments that they were making. Hmm. I have to say many commitments were made by governments, which was good because they were making the commitments to their countries. 14.2 billion was committed by government and most of it to the programs they want to scale up and accelerate in their own uh, countries. Mm -hmm. And then uh, about uh, 12 billion uh, was committed by private sector. Uh, again, some private sector saying that we support everyone from the very grassroots girl who's nine year old trying to organize her classmates. Hmm. We need to find mechanisms for these two girls to be supported uh, to the ones right at the top. But I have to tell you 40 billion is not enough. The size of the problem we have about women is much bigger than 40 billion, but it is the first amount of money ever raised that is dedicated to women. So we will take it <laughs> and, <laughs> and use it in the best way possible while we continue to ask for more. Yes, sure, absolutely. And I even wanted to say, in as much as it is not enough, Doc, this is the most that the UN has ever raised for women's issues. And for that, we really thank God. Yeah. Um, Ostelela is saying, has the Universal Declaration on Human Rights 1948 fallen short of embracing women's issues in the international order, or is it the failure of member states to enact progressive laws to promote interests of girls and women, or a combination of these two factors, among others? So which yeah. one is it? Yeah. Actually, uh, the, the charter covers uh, women quite well, but was not followed up at a national level. Countries did not pass laws that bring the, the charter to life yeah. at a country level. And in countries where that was done, you see the difference. Mm -hmm. um, we have to always make sure in our countries that what in South Africa we call chapter nine institutions really assist with these uh, uh, issues. Because even if you can make decisions at an international level, if you do not have the basis at a country level, they still fall short. That is why at the beginning I started by saying, when I started here, one of my missions was the passing of laws that end discrimination against uh, women. Right now, we have been able to then raise 6 billion US dollars just for the eliminating of discriminating laws for, for Southern, in East Africa. Just that region still has an intense number of uh, laws that are, are, are discriminating against women. Yeah. Sure. Thank you so much, Doc. Before I give back to Ospalisa, what is your uh, opinion on the impact that the church has on one, these discriminating laws but to the elimination of the very same discriminating laws? Uh, unfortunately, uh, the countries where we've seen uh, 
less progress is the country where the church is very strong. Um, we, it has taken uh, the fight of women to just push uh, forward. Uh, it's the Muslim faith, it's the Christian faith, uh, it's all the other smaller uh, but strong religion that we have in different parts of the world that have worked um, against women. And that is why in UN Women, we reach out and want to work with the women in the church and church leaders. I am a church leader. <laughs> because of the frustration. Yeah. In the work that we're going to be doing in generation equality, we certainly at UN Women will be working and reaching out much more to churches. In South Africa, we work a lot with churches. Uh, it has been with the work uh, that we've done with the churches in some parts of the country that we were able to reduce violence uh, uh, against women working and challenging Shibin owners uh, because uh, a lot of violence happens after drinking, which is detrimental to, to, to women. So the church is an absolute, absolute priority for you and women, an absolute priority for me, the Methodist church, which is the church of my husband, uh, is one of the important constituencies and a solid foundation for generating uh, the support for the things that we care about. So the relationship between the church and UN women is absolutely important. I think there must be somebody from UN women who is uh, to join this call and they will take this forward. They will be asking you to collaborate with them. They collaborate with SACC, but it really would be superb to collaborate with the women of the Methodist Church. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really think that it would be uh, a groundbreaking collaboration, and, but mm -hmm. also a very a very necessary one because yes. in the Methodist Church of Southern Africa, not because I'm a member, but because we have these conversations so often because we have to normalize having these conversations to say mm. the church can be a good uh, space or a place but it can also be a toxic a toxic space so how do we stop the church from being a toxic space outside of the church now into politics doc would you consider coming back into south african politics after your term i am coming back after my yeah. service <laughs> uh, which ends this year so I'm certainly in a hurry, you know, after also what happened last week, the devastation from COVID, there's so much work to do in South Africa. So I certainly am coming back. If I do any international work, I'll have to do it from South Africa. But my focus really has to be doing something for South Africa. Yes. Thank you, Jesus, for that. From your lips to God's ears. <laughs> Thank you so much. Time is not on our side. Um, the hour that we were given has long passed. But there is a burning question here, Doc. Um, it is light. It has humor. And I can't not ask this one. Um, this one comes from Umusanati Musweni. Okay, Umama has traveled to so many different countries, different cultures, and the diversity of people. For example, as stated, soon she will be heading to Sudan on a peace mission. What is the one thing that she brings each time she travels, the one thing she can never leave behind on each trip? You know, 
on <laughs> difficult question, but really uh, on each trip, the one thing that uh, you must never leave behind is your humility because that brings you closer to people of all ranks from the most grassroots to the one at the top. Bring your humility and bring your truth. Be strong enough to tell the truth, but bring it anyway. Uh, it is a good companion in this work and in, in the kinds of conversations that we have in these trips, which can be very difficult. You can never, ever <laughs> go wrong with humility. Thank you so much, Doc. I think this was one of um, our highlights, my personal highlights um, for the year, having this session with you. And we would like to thank you so much for your time. We would like Thanks. to thank you for gracing our session with your presence. Um, and on behalf of Ukolani, I think everyone that here would first like to thank Ukolani for his resilience. And everyone that is watching this today, we are going to take that from him. We are going to be resilient people who are not going to take no for an answer. But on behalf of Wesley Girls SA, we would really, really like to thank you. And thank you for all that you've shared with us. I think we have taken some information that we didn't know, particularly about you and women. You know, um, we know that you, were, you and women exist, but we did not know what exactly um, the organization can do and has done. And therefore, we thank you very much, Mama. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, it's been wonderful uh, to talk to you. And I totally agree with you that we all need a mission, a small yeah. one and a big one. But we cannot go without a, a, a mission in our lives. Otherwise, we lose direction altogether. So yeah. it's been wonderful uh, to work, do this job and to follow my mission. And as I leave, having made the organization bigger from about one thousand people to now 3,000 plus people, increased its budget, diversified the stakeholders who worked with them, changed laws of countries. I feel I have not been able to do everything that needs to be done for women. Uh, I've just run my race as hard and in the best way possible. And that's all God wants us to do, I think. It's just to do our best. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mama. And allow me to say that God will reward you endlessly. Um, I would like to now hand over to our presiding bishop um, to do the closing remarks. Our presiding bishop is Reverend Purity Malinga, who is the first woman to occupy this role in the history of the church. Now talk about a woman on a mission. Um, she was also the first woman to be elected as bishop in the MCSA, and she is no stranger to this platform. We were talking to um, the presiding bishop last week, and she is here again this week, gracing us with her presence. Over to you, um, presiding bishop. Thank you, moderators, um, the uh, guest speaker, Osis uh, Pumzile and the everyone in the platform, um, I greet you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, mine uh, is to thank you for availing yourself to to talk to us. Um, I don't know when last where you called me um, Lambo. I googled this one. I, I don't know because sometimes Google tells you things that are not there. Ayum Dineka. Yebo. Oh, wonderful. Umla Bomkulonga Wellamu. TV. 
<laughs> yeah, bo. <laughs> okay, at least I got something right. Um, the the Sizulu, the Sunzile, si si bonga ngas si si bonga si solama zobonga for your presence and your contribution and your sharing with us as the the Methodist women, young and old in this platform. Um, whenever we, we watch you and hear of your work as South African women, we become so proud because you have put us as Black women of South Africa on the map in the world. And God has used you to touch the lives of many women, particularly women who are struggling with the laws of their countries, struggling with oppression, but with the work of UN women, uh, since you have been there, there has been uh, a lot of change that a number of countries are talking about. And so we are very proud of you and we continue to pray for you. And we are excited to hear that you are coming back home. Uh, after the past week, as you have said, there is so much work that needs to be done. And on behalf of the Methodist Church and Methodist women, I want to say that the information that we have shared is going to, to actually help us to get involved and to fulfill the mission that is before us as, as the Methodist Church. Uh, you have shared with us uh, many important advices for women in leadership. Um, I, you talked about keeping your eyes on the ball and you talked about lifting as you climb, reaching out and, and create team spirit and so on. All those are important advices, particularly for those who are in leadership young and old. And so I want to, to really thank you. And again, thank you for your support. So on behalf then of everyone in the platform, I want when you come back uh, next the uh, next year, we definitely are going to hook up with you and work together with you. Uh, God, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Back to moderators. Thank you very much, Mama. Um, thank you very much, Prasadi Bishop. Um, yes, I would really like to thank everyone that is on this call and everyone that is watching this session for joining us. And I would like to extend my gratitude once again to Dr. Pumzilim Lambumuga. I would also like to thank my co-host, um, the beautiful Salaila Arinsa. Um, from me, good night and God bless. Before we hand over back to um, the presiding bishop to toast for us in prayer, I will just hand over to Salaila to do her goodbyes. Good night. Thank you so much, Auspalesa. Um, There's also, I must add, that it is one of my greatest highlights. It gives me so much pleasure and it humbles me immensely whenever I talk to women that I look forward to and that I look up to because I, I'm looking at you, uh, Dr. Mlambunuk, and I'm like, that could be me, you know? So I'm seeing myself in you. And I always say to people that we have on the platform that there is a young girl somewhere in some very deep, a rural area that might watch this uh, conversation and say, so it is possible for me. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the mm -hmm. teachings 
we thank you for sometimes teaching us without even saying a word. You know, you have taught us with the way you have led your life. You know, despite anything, you continue to be a woman of valor and a woman that most of us would like to be like. And for that, I say, may God continue to bless you. May everything that you touch continue to grow and to glow. And to our presiding bishop, Mama Wetu, you are with us and you are us. We are you, and uh, we are so happy that you always have time to join us on this platform. You never look down on this platform and say, this is a platform of young people, and therefore I don't have time. And for that, I want to be like you one day, from my lips to God's ears. So for me, it's me thank too. you. <laughs> me too. <laughs> So from me, thank you so much and good night to all of you and God bless you. We'll give to our presiding bishop to close for us with a prayer. Now I'm going to organize the caucus, the next presiding bishop, uh, Selai Lo Arense. <laughs> <laughs> it is done, it is done. <laughs> let, us, you, let us pray, let us pray. Uh, gracious God, we... We thank you, we honor you for times like this that you give to us, times to celebrate life and gifts that you give to women and men to serve you in this world. We thank you for Sis Pumzile's life and her ministry and her mission in life. Inspire the women who are listening to, to who are listening to her particularly our young women, our daughters who are growing up in this world and some are still search searching for their mission in life. May they be inspired by these sharings and teachings. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Have a good one.